guitar practice session 10 8 24. These are fairly sloppy practice sessions where we practice whatever I think I need to be working on, hoping that the practice sessions help to generate a routine, verbalize the things that I'm trying to learn to get it in my mind better, possibly provide information to others, learning similar things, possibly also providing for feedback if anybody sees a better way to try to get the stuff I'm trying to get in my head, in my head. The practice sessions might be a little bit different than other practice sessions you have seen, spending a lot of time trying to organize everything going the same way so it's as easy as possible to visualize the fretboard from your perspective as a player behind the guitar where you have the low or heavy string on top, the one closest to the ceiling. If you implanted that guitar onto the page of the screen, we would have the mirror of the low or heavy string on top and then top to bottom, left to right in the same format as you from behind the guitar. I'll also flip my guitar around so it looks like I am left-handed and try to align the fretboard somewhat around the position or frets we will be working on. In this case, we're looking mainly at uh, fret number 12 so that you can basically line everything up as best we can to make it as easy as possible to just analyze the different shapes on the fretboard and then apply them to our instrument, to our guitar. We're gonna be looking at what I would call fret uh, shape number four again. We'll talk about different names for that shape again. We're looking at the major scale, otherwise known as mode one Ionian mode. We're gonna be this time going from the bottom of the shape uh, back up to the top of the shape, which means we're crossing over what I call the fault line, which means all the shapes have been adjusted slightly and we have to be able to recognize them uh, basically that way. And then we'll talk about the major scale and the numbering system for the modes that we base on the major scale and why that uh, is important uh, to learn. Then we're gonna go through the intervals, uh, trying to memorize these intervals as best we can in the major scale so we can then apply the same concepts uh, to other scales as we move around the fretboard and in different modes. Then we talk about once again, the shapes within uh, this shape, breaking out our analogies, which I usually call the house analogy or the five note pentatonic analogy. And then before going through these intervals, we'll jump back to what I call the lean back shape. Once again, thinking about this shape, which is a two note per string way to play the, the scales, the major scale and related modes, which I spend a little bit more time on, not just looking at the key of C this time, but also thinking about the minor. So I look at the minor because these are going from the minor key, the minor mode, and then looking at the Locrian mode, and then looking at the key of C gives us those three kind of relationships between those couple notes which helps us to kind of mess around with this shape possibly in a more applicable format. So we'll consider that and think about how these shapes relate to the current shape that we're looking at, how we can use these same intervals to build this two note per string shape. And they're just the same intervals, but with slightly different rules than we think about when we break out the five shapes on the fretboard. We'll similarly do that with the three notes on a per string shape and just go through once again our intervals this time just really in the key of c is all i really kind of focus in on here and think about how i have the same intervals as we do when we're, when we're on shape number two but this time i have a different shape that's going out this way and that's just because we have a different rule in terms of we're going to play three strings every time and the the, the guitar is the same all the notes are the same but we end up with a slightly different shape and we'll try to reconcile the differences so we understand it and then we'll go back here and i'll tell a joke in between there it's a it's a not a great joke but it, you know it is what it is it's kind of a joke rant and then we go back from here from the bottom note to the top note focusing more specifically on the intervals and every shape on the which is kind of like the inverse intervals as we compare it to this c so we can try to get the intervals related to the shape down uh, as best we can. And so then we go through that a little bit more quickly. And then I go once again back to this one and just practice our our modes in one shape, this time always playing the complementary modes around the key of A. So we do the majors, which is the majors, looking at the interval related to the majors 
on what I would call position two. And then we look at the related major modes, which are going to be the Lydian. So we see how just changing one interval changes our whole shape from what I would call uh, shape number two to this shape, uh, which is going to be shape number four. And then we go to the Mixolydian, which once again has one interval different from the major, which if we map it out, we'll see the difference between what I would call shape number two and what I would call shape number five, or you might just call it the Mixolydian shape. Then we'll look at the minor shape, which is what I would call shape number one around the key of A, A minor this time. And we'll compare it to the minor modes. Scrolling up, we see the minor mode of the Dorian, which has one distinctive interval on the sixth. How that one interval changes the shape from being what I would call shape number one uh, to what I would call shape number uh, three, or just the Dorian shape, or from a caged system, the D shape. Uh, uh, and then we go to the Phrygian, which would convert what I would call shape number one by changing the second interval to what I would call uh, shape number four. You might just call it uh, the Phrygian shape or from a cage system, the D shape. So we'll go over uh, all of that again and then just kind of noodle and I just noodle around for a little while in there. Continuing on with what I would call shape number four, this time going from the bottom to the top of what I would call mode number one, the Ionian mode, otherwise known as the major scale within this shape number four. Remembering that the numbering system we're using for the modes is going to be an absolute numbering system based on the major scale or Ionian mode. And therefore, it's going to tie out exactly to the relative positions on the left. However, when we go to a different mode, then the relative positions are going to change, but we're going to keep the numbering systems for the mode absolute in an attempt for that to help to orientate ourselves as we kind of circle through the different modes. So in this case, we're in the major scale, otherwise known as mode one Ionian mode. We have the relative positions based on the scale that we're in, which is going to be the key of C. So we have no sharps and flats, which of course will start on the C note and go through all the non-sharp and flat notes, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. And then we're going to have the modes, which will give us more information, noting that just knowing the relative positions can help us to determine whether we have a major chord construction or a minor chord construction. Because if we memorize that in the major scale, the one, four, five are the notes which we can build a major chord on. In other words, if we have a triad, three notes, we have a major third as opposed to a minor third. And then uh, the two, three, six are going to be the ones that we can construct a minor chord on, meaning we have a minor third as opposed to a major third. And then the seventh has a minor third, but it's also that diminished one, which has that diminished fifth. So that is a very practical thing to do. And that's why you might remember all the time, like a one, four, five progression is usually thought of as kind of like a blues progression, but it's the progression with all the majors uh, in it. And so we're not talking about the seventh in it, which you might get into like in the blues, just like three notes, the triad, all the majors, and then the two, three, six are the minors. Now to go beyond that though, would be to say, which mode am I in? If I know which mode I'm in, then I can construct something beyond just the three notes. I know more than just the third. I can then start thinking about the other intervals that are gonna be involved, not in relation to the first note in the scale, but into relation to the note that I'm building the chord around. And that's why this is quite useful, quite relevant, to be able to know the actual mode related to each of the notes that we are on, allowing you to com construct more complex chords that are still in the same key that you're basically working in. Now, so if I then was to go to like the Dorian, for example, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have the same one through seven relative positions, the same notes over here, but of course the starting point has changed. We have a new starting point this time on D, uh, rather than starting on C. And so that's going to mean that all the related, uh, all the related uh, uh, modes are going to differ. So it's going to be more difficult for me to say, well, do I play a minor chord or a major chord on it? But if I can tie it back to the major scale, where I have an idea at least of the one, 
four, five being major and the two, three, six being minor, that will help me. And beyond that, if I can tie it back to the absolute numbering system that's based on the major scale, then again, that will help me to determine whether I build a major or minor chord as well as more detailed chords based on which mode that we're playing. So that's why it's quite practical to do. And that's why uh, even though we might have a feeling that we have an idea of the scale in the major scale, we really want to get these modes down in the major scale. Be able to say this is mode one, two, three, four, five, six, and know, you know the name of the mode, even though the names are kind of wonky, uh, because that's the baseline for us to then compare them to the, to the others. We're going to use that as our key, kind of like a, the major scale is our Rosetta Stone. That's the one we kind of know that we can make comparisons to the other to the other modes even though there's nothing special about the major key it's just one one way to see it in a fractal picture that you can derive everything else from but that's what we typically do then we want to be building the intervals so again the intervals were constructed in western music based on the major scale so that means that once again it's kind of like our rosetta stone it's the one that we want to learn first so we'd like to get all these down as best possible in the major scale and then compare that this is what i would my, my thought process is currently thinking get the majors down then get the minors down and then we get the other modes down uh, as we compare to the relative major and the minor because the modes that are going to be major modes like the lydian and the mixolydian will be just like the major scale or ionian mode except that they're going to have just one interval that will differ and the minor modes the uh, dorian and phrygian are going to be just like the main minor scale or mode otherwise known as mode number six which is the aeolian mode except that it's going to have one interval that's different so to in order to do that you can piece that together just step by step by first just making sure we have down the major scale which is like our rosetta stone and use that as our benchmark to compare the minor scale to, and then use the major and minor scales as a benchmark to compare the relative major and minor modes to them. So that's gonna be the strategy. So that means that the, the major scale, remember that these numbering systems are based on the relative position to the scale, seven, there's seven positions, seven notes out of 12 in a, sca in a, in a scale. And they're trying to give us whether it's going to be major or minor, which helps with the intervals. However, on the guitar, it's harder for us to see the distance of the intervals because it's not all on one string like a piano. It's not linear. So I'm also going to be adding the steps that are included that would be similar to inches on a ruler or centimeters on a ruler. So if I said like a, a major third, that's four inches on a ruler if you compare it to a ruler. If you lose the fact that it's four inches on the ruler, you're just going to learn this shape. And that's cool, but, you, but you're losing a little bit of like, why does that work? Well, it's because the actual baseline measuring uh, unit, in this case, half steps, is four. And you've, you've lost that because I can't see it between the two strings unless I know the relationship between the two strings. So we're going to practice then... The, the 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 half step units as well as <clears throat> the relative position so it has a perfect first and then it has a major second it's going to be a two note away two half step away major second it's got a four half step away major third remembering that the third relates to the fact that it's the third position and then the four represents the fact that it's actually four notes that are similar to inches four half steps and then we've got the perfect fifth which is a five note away perfect, I mean, five note away perfect fourth. I always say that and I apologize if I mess people up on that because I get this five and this five mixed up, but it's five notes away and it's a perfect fourth because it's the fourth relative position. And then we have a seven note away perfect fifth because it's the fifth relative position, but it's seven half steps away from the C, which is our starting point. And then we have a nine note away major six, which is the sixth position but it's nine note away from the C in terms of half steps and an 11 note away major seven, which is the seventh position and 11 notes away from the root point, which is uh, the C. So that's what we're trying 
to basically get down and we can construct our our shape over here using just the knowledge of the shape itself that helps me to, to visualize it but we can also build it by intervals if we know the actual distance of these intervals because we can count it out to, in order to count it out i also need to know the distance between strings which is usually five step differences between strings it's a fourth apart except for the distance between uh these two strings where the fault line is so and so so we need to basically uh build that and then we can start to build from any place not just the top note like if you know the intervals you don't need to start on the top note and play through the shape from the top you can start on any note and build from from that note based on the interval structure and you will end up with a familiar shape right it's it's like it's like plotting dots on a on a graph that end up being a cat right when you did that as a kid probably right you plot a bunch of dots on the x and y axis and it draws a cat well if you knew how to draw the cat you could draw the cat before you plot the dots and then plot the dots if you knew exactly how to draw the cat or you could draw the cat and then put the line between the dots right you could do it either way so that means what so when we learn the shape i'd like to also learn the shape and be able to see where each note is relative to the to the to the to the modes because if i know where each of the notes are relative to the modes then i can figure out where the root is and i can build my shape based on the intervals if i needed to so i'm not spending as much time memorizing the notes in the key of c because although that's useful it's not as useful particularly on the guitar as memorizing the shapes that are related to the modes and the and the full shapes here because those are the things that are are transferable as we go from the key of c and related minor modes to the key of g and related minor modes and so on and so forth so that's what i'm trying to keep repeating in my mind so we have this shape which i can call shape number four uh, i call it shape number four because if we start here and have that rock and roll shape and then we have the second shape on the top string and then the third shape and then the fourth so that would be four out of five shapes there's five shapes this would be four uh, just if we counted up that way that's kind of generic but a lot of people use that including me uh, you can also call it from the cage system a c shape because in open position which this shape is on the 12th fret which is repeating from the open position here's our c construction the c is off obviously the 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 root because we're on the major scale and so you can take that shape there's only there's only three notes being played although there are repetitive notes being played here and that means that i can use that to then fit it into the five note pentatonic shape i can't use it to visualize to fit into the seven note shape because it will not fit uniquely into a seven note shape so if i'm using the cage system i have to be able to say hey look there's my three note shape the chord and then i build my five note shape on top of it and i will end up with a unique uh, position which i call position number four of five notes and then i can add the two other notes on top of it which will give me the seven note position what i would call position number four if you skip that step and you go straight to the seven note position you you might not end up with just position number four because the c fits in more than one of the five seven note positions all right so that so that so that means that when i'm looking at the fretboard if you, so that's one way the other way you can look at it is you could say well i'm going to name it from the top note in the position so the top note if i played it from here would be phrygian so if i played from this e and i just played this shape i can call that well that's the phrygian shape because i'd be playing it in the phrygian mode but there's only uh five shapes and there's seven modes so two of the modes are going to have to be the home or or some of the modes are going to have to be the home for more than one of the modes and this one you can see those will always be the ones that have this half step to start with because that means it has a minor and then if i start from the second one i'm going to call it the second position starting point second note starting point then it would be the lydian so if i start from the second note this is also the lydian shape so shape number four is the minor phrygian mode shape it's also the main major lydian mode shape 
Well, that also happens in shape number two with the major shape, which you might call an E major shape here. Uh, but it's not as pronounced because although the B is right behind it, that B represents the Locrian mode, which we don't play that much and is often just ignored, which means you just kind of call, you always just start from the C and kind of ignore the B behind it oftentimes and just call that the major shape. But it technically, if you're naming the shape from the first note in the shape could either be like the minor mode, in this case, the diminished mode of the Locrian or the major shape. Okay, so then uh, if you're looking at it from the pentatonic caged system, which is very popular, then you would build on top of that shape, on top of this C, we would build on top of it what I would think most people think of it as the barbell hamburger shape, or they might not call it that, but I think that's the shape we think of, which means we have this hamburger shape, which is a three note, a three string shape and a two string shape on a five string guitar instrument which has an added E string. That's how I'm thinking of the guitar right now, five strings plus an extra E string. So that means that we have a three, a three string sh shape and a two string shape, helping to break the shapes and the notes within them down to a chunk where our mind can remember them like the digits in a phone number. We're trying to come up with chunks that are somewhat digestible in our mind. So then, so that means and this chunk we've got we've got boom boom this shape here and then we've got the the barbell shape up top and the barbell you only play the outside of the barbell i'm imagining these on the weights on the end of the barbell and this is the handle on the barbell which averages out to that middle point where you put your hands on uh the barbell and if you memorize the outside of the barbells and the hamburger then you can add to it the added two notes to get from a five note pentatonic to a seven note shape, which would be the inter notes in the barbell representing the Locrian mode and uh, the Lydian mode. And then you actually, then you add, like I, I imagine put a hat on the hamburger baseball cap. You have this note on the left. And then in order to balance that out, you're also, it might be easier to see over here, have this note on the right uh, bottom of the hamburger. So then you can add those notes. So if you want to name the notes, by the caged system of it's a c-shaped position you would first think of the five note pentatonic on top of it and then add the other two notes to get to the seven note position which will always be the same whether we're in the key of c or in the key of g or whatever like that the shape will be the same and you can always do that if that's what you if that's the way we want to see it the other way i think is common to see it is what i call the seven note house analogy where we have the two strings, two strings, and one string of the five string breakout, which means you've got the, the double stop uh, house, and then the house uh, double stop, which is here, and then the two note per string flat. That's the way I see it. And so you could see it that way. And if you see it that way, you might wanna go from a seven note shape down to the five note pentatonic. How can I convert that to the five note pentatonic? Well, you take the house part of the house analogy and remove the top, or le top left, which is the Locrian, and the bottom right, which is the Lydian, and that leaves you with the five note pentatonic shape. So those are a couple different ways uh, that we can see it. Now, it's useful to break them out in that smaller shape because then I can basically visualize not, I don't have to play from the top of the shape down every time I play the shape, I can start anywhere you know within the shape and try to figure out where i am at and then i can get to the point of saying where do each of these modes live in the shape because then i can i can list is this the first second third fourth fifth and so on of the shape beyond that i'd like to see it in terms of modes because if i'm playing not in the key of c major but rather in the dorian the relative positions first through seven are going to change, right? So this C is no longer the first, it's still the first of the related major, but now, but now it's not the first of the Dorian of the Dorian. It's now the seventh. However, if I keep an absolute mode numbering system, then I can still say, well, that, that is still the, what I would call mode number one or the Ionian mode of the related uh, of the related items, right? Of the, of the related modes. 
So that's why that's useful to do because that's not going to change in either any of the related modes. I can always use that. And if I go from a key of C to the key of G, for example, then I'm going to have the same shape. It's just that this top note will be a G because everything will be shifted up and it'll look like that. That's be the notes that I'll have colored once we move to the key of G, as we can see basically over here. Here's the key of G and you can see this box right here has the G at the top right. So that's why it's all it's all relative, just like a just like a Excel spreadsheet, because it basically is an Excel spreadsheet. Look at this thing. It's Excel spreadsheet. All right. Which is beautiful, by the way. That's not a put down. All right. Let's just take a quick look at these intervals from top to bottom. And then I'm going to try to view them again from the lean back position and the three note position just so we get an idea of how you can see this from different ways. And then we'll go back and look at the intervals from the bottom to the top. So let's just get, so if I just try to build this by interval, right? Actually, instead of doing it here, let's first go to the lean back tab and look at it here. So now I've got this shape that's going to be leaning back. I'm going to compare it to this shape. This is the shape that we probably would go to first when we're looking at like a major uh, shape, which I would call uh, position number two. You might also call it a like an E caged uh, shape type of position. Let's first think of this position as it's in this yellow. It's kind of hard to see the yellow brackets, but the yellow brackets are around it here. And let's just think about the intervals like in the normal shape. And here are the intervals that are listed. So what do we have here? We've got a two note away, uh, major second. So two note away, major second. So that's gonna go do do. And so then we've got then a, a, a next one, four note away, major third. So that's our major third position. And then we've got our uh, five note away, perfect fourth. So five note away, perfect fourth stacked on top of each other. And then we've got our seven note away, perfect fifth. Seven note away, perfect fifth. That's the power chord. And then we've got the nine note away, major six. So it's going to be down here. Nine note away, uh, major six. And then we've got the eleven note away, major seven, which is going to be out here. The eleven note away, uh, major seven. In the octave okay so that's going to be in position within this position now just to note that's not the only way to see it i just kind of want to break out of that box a little bit just to remember that you can you know see it visualize it other ways and these are just some other ways to visualize it which i think don't get emphasized as much and we start to think that you can only kind of see it basically one way but and i don't this the way we're looking at it is the most efficient way to build chords from typically uh, because then you can grab more strings in one area if you can stack all of the all the notes within a scale into four to five frets you'll be able to reach more of them however the notes that are on the same string are going to be more difficult to reach because you can't play them at the same time you can arpeggiate them and so on and so forth and different octaves. So anytime you play any chord differently, even if the tone of the chord is supposed to be in the same octave, it's gonna sound different on the guitar because it's a totally different string. You can also usually finger it more different in a different way, right? Like if I happen, if you're on a guitar and you happen to land like on the second finger, you're gonna do a hammer on oftentimes because it's just fun to do or a pull off. Right. Whereas if it's the first note in the key and this, and I'm not, I can't do a hammer on, right? Or if the third is back here, then I'm not, there's not as much I can do. I can bend it back here, but there's a whole, it just depends on where it lies. You're just going to naturally do different things. Cause you're going to start to play with the, play with the notes, different, different ways, just because of the mechanics of your hand. So, so anytime, and, and just because the strings are different. So the same note, you know, I can play the same note like an like an A here and an open A. Those are supposed to be the same. They sound pretty much the same, but th they're still different, right? Like if I if I play both of them, they're still different. And and if I hold my finger down on this one, I can tweak it 
whereas I can't do that in an open note, right? So there's a lot of different different stuff that will happen if you just play it a little bit different of a way. So it's useful to kind of see it in, in different ways, and that's one way we can, might put variation. So one way is, to, is this lean back thing, and all that's happening here when we did this rule, I applied these intervals, and we applied the rule to say that I'm only going to play I'm going to I'm going to only play up to 4 frets. I never go beyond 4 frets. That's the rule. And that mean that basically keeps me in this stack. But if I switch the rule and say now I'm going to play only two notes per string, then we end up with this lean back shape. Now, I like to think of this lean back shape as basically just combining together the basic uh chords uh, that would be constructed. So if this is a C or this is the one chord, I would construct a C. And then if this, so it's the one, three, five, the one, three, five. And if this was the, uh, the two chord, that means I'd make a minor from it. So that would be, that would be the, the one, three, five going down this way. And then I just connect the two and you end up with a scale. I think that's cool. So C, D, E, F, G, A. So that would be in in uh, the key of C, and then of course we can keep on going uh, down from that point. So if I look at the intervals, what happens with the intervals? Well, I've got a, I still got a major second, same two note away major second, and just like we did before, I'm not gonna reach up to this one as we would in the three note per string, bec because it would violate my shape in here of being only spanning four, uh, frets and the other but this one I've only got two notes per string so that's why I go down here and that's going to give us the uh, two note away major second or I'm sorry uh, now I'm on the three note four note away major third and then that's the same under the two positions and then I've got the next one which is a five note away uh, perfect fourth that was this one and then we're going to go to the seven note away fifth, which usually is my power chord. So normally I would go here, but because we're only doing two notes per string, we move back here. So now I can see that shape. So now if I, if I look at it this way, now I'm like, okay, wait a sec. That's a fifth, which is useful to know because this is also a fifth, but you get a different sound. That way, so the, so now we've got a fifth on the on the lean back fifth, and then we've got then going to the next one, we've got the nine note away uh, major six. Oh, wait a second, I messed up my fifth there. The fifth should have been here. I was up an octave as opposed to. All right, and then we've got here not an octave, I was up a string, a note. So nine note away major six, that's the same in both of the shapes. And then when I go to the seventh, instead of going here to the seventh, we're gonna lean it back here to the seventh. So now I'm leaning back to the seventh, which is to right there, is that right? I think that's right. So that, so, so you get a different, so you kind of get a different sound when we go, when we go that way. So then I'm also, so the, to, to put these together, often I play in the key of A. And so you have A, you've got B, C, and D, which this shape <clears throat> works for in the key of C in related modes. So let's go down to the key of A and just look at this in the key of A. Let's copy this orange one here. I'll copy that. We'll go down to the key of A or the minor, the minor scale. So now if I say that that's my, now I'm in Aeolian, then same kind of thing. I'm over here. If that's my Aeolian, I'm in a minor mode, then I'd make a minor chord, one, three, five. So one, three, five. And then I make the next one, which is now the diminished. So that's the one where I have to go boom, 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 stretch it. That's stretchy to actually play the chord. Doable if you play, especially if you hold the guitar in like a classical and put your thumb back in the back a little more. 
Then I can play that one, three, five, and it has a flat five. That's why you get this added stretch there. And then if I connect it to A, B, C, D, E, F, I'm playing now in the key of a minor key. So if I was to play the minor key normally from the key from this point, then it would go, what would I have? I would have the second, it would still have a, a two note away minor second because the minor key has a minor second. But then I would normally reach up to this C. I would call this, by the way, position number one. So then I would reach up to this C, which would give me the three note away minor third. And then I would go back to the, the five note away perfect fourth, which is right underneath. And then we would go to the seven note away perfect fifth, seven note away perfect fifth power chord. And then we would go to the eight note away uh, minor six, eight note away minor six. And then we would go to the 10 note away minor seven, 10 note away minor seven, and then the octave. If I play the two note per string, then what's gonna happen? We're gonna, we have the, still the same, the same uh, major second, and then the minor third, instead of moving out here, I'm not using that rule because the rule now is only two notes per string, therefore I'm moving back. So you get the same interval, but now it's back here. So now that's the three note away minor third. So I could see that shape is a, is a three note away minor third and that shape is a three note away minor third. I can't play this C if I'm playing a chord, I can only ar arpeggiate it two notes at a time. But back here, of course, I can play that together. So that's one of the advantages of playing this way, you know, just in terms of where it's, where it's located. And then I can say, okay, well then the next one is gonna be the five note away perfect fourth, which is the same under both shapes right underneath. And then I would go to the seven note away perfect fifth, which normally would be up here. That would be my power chord. But instead of doing that, I'm leaning back, I'm skipping that note and bringing it back here. So that gives me my perfect fifth, seven note away perfect fifth. So this is a perfect fifth, seven note away perfect fifth. This is a seven note away perfect fifth. And then I can add the third in there and I get my, my triad. And then we get the, uh, the eight note away minor six. So instead of it being up here, so uh, eight note away minor six, now we're going back uh, to here. And then we've got the 10 note away uh, minor seven. So the 10 note away minor seven is going to be the G, which I can't really reach this way, but it's an open string. So I can always play it. So the G would normally be right here. If I'm leaning back, I can't really reach. That would be way back there, but it's an open string. So if I played like this, I can leave that open string. So you can see the limitations here on this, on this pattern. If I'm leaning back and I'm doing this two note per string thing, I'm gonna be limited. I can't go quite as far back, right? Cause it's gonna be out of my four fret my four to five fret fingering, but I'm gonna come up with a different fingering system. And if I pattern it, I can move down the fretboard and then move up the fretboard. Different, and that's gonna be one of the advantages because now I can, I have a little bit of a, an angle to be going through what I would call position one down and down to position four and back up to position one. Let's, and now let's do the same with the B, which is funny because it's the Locrian but the Locrian's in our position because I, if I played in the A minor, I could do. I'd also like to do it with this one, which is the next one up happens to be Locrian, which I don't typically play in, but it would be nice to have that pattern. So what would it look like? Well, if I played the Locrian from that B, I'd get a one, a one, three, five, like that. 
and then and then the next one up from there is the C, which is which would be my major. So if I put those together, I won't get into detail on this, but I get the pattern. So that's kind of fun to play with, right? So if I get if I get the A, I can go and then make my chord A minor, low crin, re chi chord, and then the C. Back to low grin. Back to A. And then you can come up with patterns within there, right? I can go backwards. I could try to skip every other note to go to, to, to every other note, like one to the third. I've been playing with that and then if I look at the three notes per string similar similar kind of thing here we're just gonna we could just change the rule so I'm in the same starting point and if I was in uh, the key of C again and let's just walk through this fairly quickly and then I'll get back to where we want to where, where my normal practice so if I go from so if I go from the first to the second in this position two note away uh, major second but then instead of going back here as we would under our normal shape because we've spanned four frets we're gonna our rule is to always go three frets up from the starting point which happened to start on c this time which is still in the same place in the box but i'm not counting the back of the box as part of the shape so i'm going up here so now that's useful to know because now i've got that that is now my my four note away major third which is in a lot of ways more useful than this back here because if I'm playing this a lean forward shape it's just it's going to be more technically difficult to go back here like I have to go back here and then make okay but if I'm doing a lean forward shape like this an E normal E bar chord I can reach out of the shape to get that one quite easily and that third is obviously Quite useful so that little reach is nice and then and then of course if we're going to the the uh, five note away perfect fourth I no longer need to go to this third so now I'm up here same position under both shapes whoops what am I doing five note away perfect fourth and then we go to the seven note away perfect fifth which is the same under both shape conventions for the key of C in position number two versus the three note per string shape power chord and then we're in the six though now we have a nine note away major six which normally i would go back here because if i'm thinking about this as my starting shape i've already gone four frets out so i can't go out anymore but here i am because i'm starting on the f and i'm going three notes per string so then i can reach out here that's reaching but useful because otherwise to get that six I'd have to go back to here which means I've got to shift my finger and if I'm leaning forward like most people are when they're playing in the major key this way it's kind of a pain to go back here it's going to be easier if you have long enough fingers anybody can do it if, if you, even I've seen little small women doing this so I feel like with smaller hands so I feel I have no, I don't think anyone has any like, uh, can really say, well, my hands are too small kind of excuse. So anyways, that's gonna be easier to reach kind of outside of the shape. And then I've got then the the 11 note away uh, major seven back in here. So we're, we have the 11 note away major seven. And then back home. So uh, I won't go into that one in more detail. Let's go back to 
Let's see, and last time we went from here down to here, so I'm gonna go from the bottom back up top and just practice basically the look of our shapes, remembering that it's important to go back up or because I wanna cross this fault line. So now this one has gone over the fault line, so all of our shapes will be uh, different. So that's what we'll do. But first, let's try a joke here. So here's my, this is my practice session joke. Okay. Did you know that there's obviously there's so many tools to learn a new language these days? It's crazy. You've got like YouTube, you've got audiobooks, you could use ChatGTP, OneNote can actually break down the information, and then and you could slow it down to like like 0.2% of the speed so, so you can totally hear what they're saying exactly. It's crazy. You know, I've been trying to learn Spanish and French lately, having having tried to learn Spanish for like 30 years or so. I, I was thinking that French is uh, because it's also a Latin based language should be should be f relatively easy to pick up compared to some other languages was my thought process. And I noticed a few like non professional mind you observations about French compared to like Spanish, just again, non professional observations, you know, I've, I've noticed that French seems to just skip over large parts of words. I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, they just I mean, so they, they like they like skip like three to four letters that are in the word all the time. So 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 that's like half the word. Like you're reading along this thing and they skip like you 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 read like half the word and then you just skip to the next word. And I thought I thought maybe they were just saying it really fast because I can't pick it up with my ear. They just said it really fast and I didn't hear it. So I tried to slow down the YouTube video to like 0.25 of the speed which is again crazy that you can even do that and it's like no they don't say it they they just skip they just skip like large parts of the word all the time i'm telling you and i mean like why why bother why bother even writing down the letters if you're not going to say them why would you why why even have the letters there if you just like not and i'm thinking th this is my theory by the way again non-professional theory i'm thinking that the the old aristocratic French people, because it was like the lawyer language of its day, I think, you know, they were, those guys were like, they were like modern computer programmers, I'm thinking, and they got paid by the character. They got paid by the character. So when they, so when they were writing the contracts, they were writing all their legalese contracts and whatnot, I feel like they stuffed them full of like unnecessary characters to improve the billing rate. But then when you actually speak the language, like speaking computer code language, it doesn't need all that stuff and you just leave it out when you actually run the program and speak the language, you know? And then, and then French also has a beautiful flow from one word to another, often with little pause between each word, which might sound good, sounds cool, but, but how, how the heck am I supposed to know when you've moved from when you've moved on to a new word, you know, when you when you leave out like a whole half of the previous word and you don't have a proper pause between going from one word to the other, that gets a little confusing. And pl plus, just to rant a little bit here, this is probably because I'm a little, this is, I'm just trying to pick it up, but the, the, the French is supposed to be gendered. It's but like, it's supposed to, it has those masculine and feminine words in it. And if you're gonna do that, uh, how, how how are we supposed to tell if the word is going to be masculine or feminine when you leave off the ending of the word? You know, the part the part of the word which is supposed to tell you if the word is masculine or feminine. You know, leaving off the word sexuality, the, the words are now sexually ambiguous, even though you're supposed to give them like a, like a gender or something. That's, I feel like I'm on X or Twitter or something. It's like I'm supposed to like know just randomly what like even though now I've got all these different gender things and I'm supposed to just somehow know what it is even though that you don't even have it like it's supposed to be Spanish doesn't stand for that kind of thing you know Spanish I mean again I'm just an observer here but it seems like Spanish just doesn't they don't the Spanish is like hey if if we write down a letter unless it's like a silent H or something you're gonna pronounce the letter if we write down the letter we pronounce the letter. That's how that's how it seems to work. You know, they don't have any wasted writing typically on it. They just they're like we're going to say it. You know, and it, and the pronunciation will be surprisingly similar for each letter, even vowels. 
even vowels don't really change that much. You go from one word to another word and the vowels still sound like the vowels and you're not like skipping over vowels. You don't got like silent vowels in there typically. You know, it's pretty much, it is what it is, which I got to say, it's, it's much appreciated uh, for the for the learner over here. Good, I'm kind of appreciate that on this. And, and, and Spanish, Spanish isn't down with the ambiguous sexuality of the word thing either, I, you know? Most words, they, 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 they either, they're going to tell you. They're, they either end in an A ah or an A. They have an A or an E or whatever at the end of them. And you better say, you better say the A or the E at the end. You don't just leave it off. You say, you got to say the thing at the end of the word so that people know, you don't confuse people because it's supposed to have a gender on the word. And you got to be clear about, about it. Otherwise, people get confused. And I don't care. And they're like, they're like, hey, dude, I don't care what the woke people say. Uh, we're, we're not going to be replacing the, the A and the E or the A and the A or whatever with an X. They're just like, that's, that's not how we roll. So they just, have, they just keep that thing. They just, the, the words have the gender on it. And this is, I, again, this is just my interpretation as an English speaking person from my, my, my dabbling and try to learn this stuff on the YouTubes. But I feel, from, I feel like Spanish got more of like the, I don't know, it feels like they got more of the Roman, the like Roman efficiency part of the Latin kind of thing, whereas the French seems like they got more of the, the influence by the, by the ancient Greek flowing, fluidity thing or something. I, that's just my, the, the, the French does have a nice flow to it though. Get it, get, get, getting a line to at least sound somewhat French does feel impressive i've got to say and i can't i can't see why they would be proud of that that makes sense but and i shouldn't crit i i know i shouldn't criticize anybody's languages because english is is of course quite a mess you got a lot of weird things going on there with silent letters funny words vowels that are changing sounds all the time you got the same vowel they don't sound the same when you say them from different word to word but you know now that i now that i think of it much of the issues in English were probably caused by the French as well, you know, because they're, they're because a lot of the words that I I can't even spell in English seem to be French words now that I now that I think about it, like garage, like how you sp garage, like you're supposed to spell that something. It's hard to spell that word, right? It's like ooh la ti da, Mister Frenchman, we, a garage. What do you call it? I call it a car hole. A car hole. It's from The Simpsons. What a beautiful name, a car hole. <laughs> garage press. And restaurant. How are you supposed to spell restaurant? How's restaurant? That's tough. That's a tough one to spell, you know? And like can't we just call it like an eatery? Or like a like a pancake house? A diner? We could just call it like a feed your face place? I mean that's got a lot of elegant flowing rhyme to it, you know? Sounds very fancy, a feed your face place. That's what I think we should call it. Anyways. All right, so let's go from this shape. Now I'm gonna go from the bottom of the shape back up to the top of the shape. And so we'll start, let's just say we're going, where Where are we located? We're in shape number four. You might call it a C shape. If you were to say it's a Phrygian shape, how would you find uh, the, the where the C is within it? You could say, well, if it's Phrygian, then that would be the third on the E, and then just count up the shape until you get back to the octave. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That would uh, give you the C there. We also might just notice that the C happens to live in, of course, the box of the house. So where where is the major key located? Well, if I know where that, if I see where that box is, I'm going to say, well, the C is going to be at the upper. Uh, right of the box so that'll help me to uh, locate it there and then I'm looking for the octave in this case which is going to be down here and then I'll compare everything to it so let's go from uh, the the C back to the B so we're going from the 8 or the 1 or the 8 back to the 11 the 11 we know is going to be I mean the 7 <laughs> the 7 is going to be 11 notes away how do I know that? Well, if I'm going backwards, I could count from this way to that way. That means it's one note away going that way. And if I think of it as a circle, there's 12 notes. 12 minus 1 is 11. Therefore, that's where I get the 11 note away minor 7. How can I test that? 
If I count from this C up 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, I get to a B. So if I see these two notes, I can go this way, B to C, that would be a one note away, which would be a minor second. If I go backwards from C back to B, 11 note away, major seven. And then let's go back then to the, uh, to the sixth. So now I'm going to go back to the six, which is going to be uh, boom. And then right there, boom. Okay. And then that's going to be a nine note away major six. How can I test that? I'm going to say, well, it's, there's the fault line between these two. So it would be, uh, if I went up here, it would be five notes away. And then four, if, if I go up here, it would be five notes away and then four and three. So from this A to this C, that would be a three note away, a minor third. It looks like it would be a major third because I, I know that position, I'm like major third, but no, because of the kink in the tuning, it's a minor third. And the difference then 12 or the inverse 12 minus three would be nine, nine note away major six. So when I see that shape top to bottom, I'm thinking that's a minor third because it's crossing over the fault line and bottom to top, nine note away, uh, major six, therefore. Well, let's go back to then the, uh, the fifth. So the fifth is going to go from here to here. So da, da, and that's going to be here. Boom. All right. And so that's going to be a, the fifth is going to be a seven note away perfect fifth. How do I know that? Because if I count from this G up, uh, it would be five notes away. And you would think, well, no, that's a flat fifth. But no, because of the kink in the tuning, it's going to be a, uh, a major uh, fifth, which is going to be, wait a sec, if I go from here to here, that's five notes away. It's a five note away, sorry, perfect fourth. It is, it is also all right, it looks like a flat fifth. It's a perfect fourth. The fourth is usually right underneath, but it has been pushed up one. Okay, and then 12 minus five would be seven, and that would give us our seven note away perfect fifth. So when I see that shape, I'm like, there's, it looks like a flat fifth, but no, it's a, it's a uh, five note away perfect fourth. Therefore, the inverse, because the perfects are inverts of each other, is going to be a seven note away perfect fifth. All right, let's go to the next one. We're going to go to uh, back this one to the uh, to the F. Now I'm inside to the F. So to the F, we're going to go to do here on up to boom. The F. Okay, and it's kind of a funny fingering because of. The guitar up i mean i'm up on on the acoustic so it's a, it shouldn't be this painful if you weren't on the acoustic to finger that and that's going to be a it, it's the fourth so it's a five note away perfect fourth how can i know that well if i measured from the f it would be five here and then ten out to here nine eight seven so that shape is a seven note away uh, if I go from the f down a seven note away perfect fifth which you would think would be back one string here or one note back, but no, because of the kink in the tuning. And therefore the inverse from the bottom to the top is 12 minus seven, which is five, which is a five note away, perfect uh, fourth, because the perfects are inverts of each other. And then I'm gonna go back one, and we're gonna go then to the, the third. So the third of a major scale is of course a four note away major third. How can I tell that from here? Well, if I count from the F, it would be five and then 10 up here, nine, eight. So looking at that shape, it would be from top to bottom would be an eight note away, which would be a minor six. And therefore from bottom to top, that would be 12 minus eight, which would be a four note away major third. And then if I go back then to the, the prior one, we're gonna go do 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 and so now i'm back here let's do this to that that's going to be a second so i know it's going to be a two note away major second how can i tell well, if i measure from the d down 
it would be 5 and then 10. 10 node away, which would be a minor 7. It looks like it's a minor 7 is usually back here. But once again, now the minor 7 is up here because of the kink in the tuning. And therefore, the inverse would be 12 minus uh, 10, which would be a two note away major second. All right, so there is that. And so now, uh, so now I'll go next time, probably tomorrow, I'll go from this C around the horn to this C. But now let's go back to our one spot and just look at it this way, where I wanna now visualize the intervals that are complement intervals and try to solidify that in my mind. So I've been comparing the, now going around the key, around A, I'm comparing all the intervals around the A. I'm trying to get that down. So now I'm gonna say, okay, if I start off on the major and then I'll compare the relative majors to it, this is what I would call position number two, or from the cage perspective, an E-shaped uh, position. E major shaped position. You might also just call it a major shape position because on note two, it would make the major shape. If it was on note one, it would be creating a Lydian if you started from there. So then if I just played up that shape, it would be, whoops. All right, and so then, so then I can count my uh, intervals within that shape and say, well, what does it look like if I was to build it? I can find any note in this case any a that i'm looking at and i can build that same shape with intervals what would it have it has of course a made a two note away major second it's got a four note away major third by the way i could find that major third out here in the three note per string way but then if i'm in shape it goes here four notes a four note away major third and then I'm going to a five note away perfect fourth. So five note away perfect fourth, right underneath. And then I'm going to a uh, seven note away perfect fifth. There's the power chord. And then I'm going to a six, uh, a, a nine note away major six, which again, it's useful to see that you could go outside the shape to reach up here. But that's not what we're, that's not what we would do in position. We'd go back here, which is a little bit more awkward because I have to reach backwards, right? And then I would go to a 11 note away major seven, 11 note away major seven, and then back to the octave. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four. be Aeolian, Dorian, uh, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian. Is that right? Wait a sec. Let's see if I could do that. Oh, no, wait. Is that right? Yeah. Aeolian, Dorian, Phrygian, Aeolian, wait, Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, uh, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, Locrian, and back to Ionian, right? If I tried to name it in modes, I don't know if that is useful. But then I can compare the related modes that are major modes, which will only have one distinctive interval. So if I go back to the intervals, Lydian down here is the next one. So I can say, okay, it's only going to have one distinctive interval, which should be the fourth, even though it says diminished fifth here because of the, it, they're two names for the same thing, but we need a fourth, so I should be calling it an augmented fourth, so don't let that throw you off. If I just change that one thing, we change the shape. The shape changes from a, what I would call shape number two, a major E shape from a caged system to the, uh, what I would call, what I, uh, sorry, uh, what I would call the shape number shape number four so shape number four here there's our shape number four if you look at the caged system because i'm in lydian i, I named the cage system by the relative major which would be ionian 
which you can see is an E. And if I look at that E and I made a, a shape from it, it would be a C type of shape that I'm gonna be making from uh, the E and therefore you would call it a C type uh, shape, an E that we're playing in the key of E, <laughs> right? Uh, and then you might also call it still a Phrygian shape because you, you started on uh, on the first note, then you would be playing in uh, Phrygian, or you might call it note number two, the uh, Lydian shape, because we use the same shape as the core shape. If I played from the top to play either modes, because there are only five shapes and there's seven modes. So whenever you see that half step, that's the key. So if I was to play this up, then it's gonna look like this. We're gonna say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So where's the distinctive factor? One, two, three, four. That four sounds funny because you have, and it's really that tensiony sounds. So that's quite a funny one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's eight, seven, six, five. Uh, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So that's the distinctive sound. So then I can say, all right, if I was to look at look at that and isolate it, we're gonna say this. These are the two. If I was playing in the major, it would be. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And here it's one, two, three, four, five. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if I don't play either of those, then I'm ambiguous between a Lydian or a major. And that's how I can kind of build tension possibly for like a, a reveal on whether I'm in the major or, or, or Lydian or something. So if I did the ambiguous thing, I'd be like out here. I'm just trying to avoid those two notes. And then if I add the major note, switch to the Lydian. Back to the major. the lady in there first because I had to but anyway I don't know so I need to pri I need to mess with that more but that's the distinctive factor there so I'll keep on kind of playing with that idea maybe and then the mixolydian if I look at the distinctive factor here it's also a major mode it's only going to have one different one which is of course going to be the seventh everything else is the same and that will build if I do that that will build it'll change my shape from shape number two which I called an, a, a caged E shape to what I call uh, shape number five, which if you were gonna use the cage system, you'd look for the related major, which is Ionian, it's a D. And if I constructed from the D, it would be an A shape. So you could call it an A shaped D, D, right? <laughs> uh, position that we, if you wanted to use that terminology, or if you start from the top note, then you might just call it mixolydian because if I played it from the top note, it would be mixolydian. And so it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's the seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the major, so, so that means, so if I was to count that out and I could say, okay, what's the difference here then? I could say I have 
Uh, I have a major second, which is makes sense. I've got a major uh, third, four note away, major third, which again, remember I could reach out here to grab, just like I could on, but, but in shape, it would be back here. And then I've got a, a, a five note away, perfect fourth, five note away, perfect fourth, right underneath. This is all the same, that makes sense. And then we've got a seven note away, perfect fifth, seven note away, perfect fifth. And then we've got a nine note away, major six, which again, I could reach out here to grab, which would be outside of my shape, would, but that's useful to know. But I could then go back in here and it would be behind. And then I've got, here's the funny one, I've got the Lydian or the, the uh, <laughs> 10 note away minor seven has a minor seven. And that means it doesn't have the leading tone, even though it's a major and that goes back to the octave. So if I switched, if I switched that uh, between, between the two modes, I can go, the, the, the distinctive factor is going to be the seven. So here's the seven versus the seven for the major would be there. So if I don't include the seven, then it's going to sound ambiguous. It doesn't sound bad ambiguous. It's just that I don't really, I don't really know if it's an A. It sounds like it's an A something. But is it an A major or A mixolydian? Then if I make it major, and then I go to mixolydian. I, it's also note. I also think it's interesting in mixolydian that if I reach outside the shape to the three note per string shape, I have the full three pillar shape, which is this pillar, this pillar, this pillar. So if I was in major, I only have really the two pillars. I'm in the second part of the pillar, but here I've got all three. So when I'm reaching outside the shape, I've got these three notes, these three notes, these three notes. opportunities for like hammer-ons. And see that shape that kind of fits, I mean obviously this this little kind of hamburger shape fits the fingers perfectly for like hammer-ons and stuff.
should I'm gonna mess with that more. I think that's interesting to have those three. Let's look at the minors. If we look at the minors, then I can compare the intervals for the minors, which will have all the perfects the same as the major, and then all the majors then change to minors intervals, except for the second, which is still a major second. So if I was to play that, then the main minor is what I would call position number one. You might also just call it a minor position because it starts on that position from a caged system. I'd look at the related major, which is the key of C, and then build, so there's my C. If I build a chord, it's a G shape. So then I can say this is the most familiar to most people. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so then, so then if I look at my intervals, we've got a still a two note away major second. We've got a three note away major third now, or minor third. So that's nice and still, ha still conveniently within the shape. I don't have to reach outside of the shape to get that. And then we've got then a, uh, the, the fourth is a five note away, perfect fourth, same and the major and the minor. And then the fifth is a seven note away, perfect fifth, which is the same in the major and the minor. And then the sixth though is a eight note away, minor six, instead of a nine note away, major six. And then the seven is going to be a 10 note away minor seven. And then to the octave. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, six, five, four, four, three, two, one. So let's, and then if I compare, so if I take that and I compare it to the other minors, like the Dorian, it, Dorian only has one interval difference, which is the minor six, which would convert the shape to what I would call uh, position number one to uh, what I would call position uh, number three uh, now. And so, and you might also call it just a Dorian shape, because if you started from the top, you play position three. You might also look at the related major, which would be the Ionian, which would be the G note. And if I say, well, there's my G and I played a chord from there, I would be making a D shape. So you might call it a D shaped, uh, a D shaped position, <laughs> right? I, 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 and then and then I could also say it's a so then uh, if I look at my interval or if I just count through that it's gonna be one two three four five six seven well wait a second one two one two three four five six seven eight one two one two three wait a second what's going on here one two three four five six seven eight eight seven six Five, four, three, two, one. All right, and let's look at the intervals. So we've got the second, major second, the third. I already did I do the intervals? I don't think so. It's a major third, or I'm sorry, minor third. And then the fourth is going to be a perfect fourth. And then the fifth is a perfect, a seven note away, perfect fifth power chord like normal. But then the sixth is the distinctive interval from the minor, which is a major six. So notice the major six, I could reach out here, just like I can in the majors, and get and pick that one up out here. Or I can move back here, which is a little bit, I have to change my fingering to pick that one up. And then it's got a normal 10 note away minor seven. And then the octave. 
So where are the distinctive factors here? It's going to be in the sixth, which is here, copy versus here. So in the normal minor, it would be here. And then he, and on this one, you could shift it up one to right there, but in the shape, it's back here. So I'm just going to do the last one real quick just to see it out because I'm getting tired. So if I did this one, Phrygian, it's got the distinctive second in it. And that converts this from what would be shape number one, which would be the normal minor shape, to what I would call shape number four, which you can also look in the cage system and look at the F and, and say if I found the F and made a chord from it, it would be that C shape. So you could call it a C shape from the from the from that perspective, from the caged perspective. And if I count up through that, it'll be one, two, there's the distinctive two right off the bat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So if I count through the intervals, we have a distinctive second. Um, one note away, minor second. We've got then the third is back to normal. Three note away, minor third. We've got a four note away, uh, perfect fourth. We've got a seven note away perfect fifth, which is the same for most majors and minors. These perfects are power chord. We've got a six, which is an eight note away major six. So that's normal again, or minor six, sorry, eight note away minor six. And then we have the seven, which also is the norm for the minor, 10 note away minor seven, back to the octave. So it's that distinctive second. Thank you. 